to Mark Fisher. Um, Mark Fisher teaches visual cultures at Goldsmiths College. The title of today's talk is Capitalism and the Realist Capitalism. Capitalist, Capitalist <laughs> Realism. Gosh, we've been talking about it up until now. <laughs> Capitalist Realism and the slow cancellation of the future. Uh, what we will do is sort of draw on the last two books that uh, Mark, Mark Fisher wrote, uh, Capitalist Realism Indeed and Ghosts of My Life that is coming out in these days, and sort of look at the impact that the naturalization of neoliberalism is having on our lives and imagination and our sense of the future and time and temporality. So if you haven't read it, Capitalist Realism is a very uh, small, uh, beautifully written book that I highly recommend. And those of my life, there's an extract online, but again, it will be out uh, shortly, just within a few days. So I do strongly recommend those. I'm going to pass the floor to Mark, and uh, who will speak for some 50 minutes, and then we'll leave the room for the debate and some discussion. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks, thanks everyone, uh, to Francesca and Lucio for inviting me, and uh, I apologise for speaking in English, I always find it strange coming to someone else's country and speaking in my language, but <laughs> um, uh, um, if, if I speak too quickly then it's, it's okay to, to, to interrupt me and tell me to slow down, because I, I have a tendency to speak too quickly even for English people. So uh, don't, don't, don't be concerned about uh, raising my attention to that if I start to do it. Okay, so I'm going to start with three, two, two epigraphs, two quotations. Um, the first from uh, Franco Berardi Bifo, he, provide he provides part of the title for the uh, forum I'm going to say today. Um, it's from uh, Franco's book, uh, After the Future, that I took the phrase, the slow cancellation of the future. Um, and what uh, Franco says uh, to explain that is that when I say future, I'm not referring to the direction of time. I'm thinking rather of the psychological perception which emerged in the cultural situation of progressive modernity, the cultural expectations that were fabricated during the long period of modern civilization, reaching a peak after the Second World War. Uh, these expectations were shaped in the conceptual frameworks of an ever-progressing development, albeit through different methodologies. The Hegel-Marxist mythology of Alf Hegel and uh, the founding of the new totality of communism, the bourgeois mythology of the linear development of welfare and democracy, the technocratic mythology of the all-encompassing power of scientific knowledge and so on, my generation grew up at the peak of this mythological temporalization, and it's very difficult, uh, maybe impossible, to get rid of it and to look at uh, reality without this kind of temporal lens. I'll never be able to live in accordance with a new reality, no matter how evident, unmistakable, or even dazzling its social planetary trends. Okay, so um, Franco is a generation older than me. But I still feel I'm on the same side of this thing as he is. I, I grew up with that sense of mythological temporalization, that sense of uh, movement towards the future. Um, but also, I mean, there's also the sense of the future rushing in. Uh, so the, the sense of being abducted, um, ab abducted, or, or constantly, or perhaps not constantly, but periodically surprised by uh, new cultural developments, which even a few months before would have seemed unprecedented. Um, it's this, and partly what, I'm what I want to talk about today is the, the disappearance of this sense of surprise. Now, two things, actually. First of all, the dis disappearance of the sense of surprise and, the, and its replacement by a uh, sense of um, repetition, homogeneity, pastiche. Um, the, f 
flattening out of the, a flat, the, the experience of a kind of flattening out of time. Uh, so that the surprise is gone, and also the sense of uh, narrative of time is gone. The sense of uh, culture being marked and marking time, you could say. Um, and this uh, specifically relates to music culture for me. And, and I guess particularly British music culture. Um, from, you know, the, 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 and, and I guess the, the, the fate of British music culture is a kind of case study for me of the effects of neoliberalisation. Uh, you know, if we think about the, the, the great efflorescence of British music culture, you know, and its kind of global effect uh, between 19, the early 1960s and the end of the 1990s, you know that this was this this really this exemplifies what I'm talking about by this this sense of futurity really and constant surprise. This capacity of the of, of uh, British music culture at that time to perpetually renew itself, uh, reinvent itself, and to give a kind of uh, experience of the present of, of the present moment and a sense of what the future might be. Um, of course this wasn't exclusive to British music culture, I'm just using that as an example. And also something which, you know, uh, uh, obviously being my age in my mid-40s now and uh, coming from, from Britain, you know, was uh, my, well, taken for granted, um, kind of taken for granted uh, infrastructure of my experience. You know, and uh, it, it's part of a broad, I, I, I now see a lot of those things, a lot of the key aspects of that British music culture as part of a broader development I call popular modernism. Um, where the, the, features that, the features of experimentalism, of the avant-garde, um, of, um, of, of kind of cutting edge aesthetic techniques were disseminated and extended and transformed in a popular medium, by, you know, via popular media. And I guess part of the significance of, um, of British music culture was it wasn't just about music at this time, that it really was about a relationship between, it was about a certain cultural infrastructure, you could say. Art schools, um, you know, going, going right back to the 60s, uh, a lot of the major British groups had an art school connection, even groups like The Who or whatever, there was an art school connection uh, to, to their work. Um, it was, you know, art school, therefore visual art, um, film, um, sound, in, in a kind of relationship with one another. It was also uh, to do with the development of public service broadcasting at a certain stage, uh, and paperback publishing, um, these new fields of dissemination. Uh, and also, uh, cr actually critical for me in my development uh, was the music press. Um, the music press, uh, which has transformed out of, all, uh, uh, out of all recognition over the last 30 or so years. Uh, when, I, when I first started I reading the British music press when I was about 15, uh, you know, a long time ago, almost 30 years ago, um, this was where I first had uh, access to, this is where I first saw French theory mentioned, this is where I first saw the names of uh, Jean Baudrillard, Jacques Derrida, you know. Um, it's unimaginable now. If, you, if one was to look at uh, the British music press now, the NME, New Musical Express, uh, if you look at it now, it's incomprehensible to imagine a time when, you know, that, that paper was engaging in discussions about Baudrillard or, or Derrida. You know, that simply has disappeared. Um, and with it, I, I think what has happened uh, is a massive kind of re-stratification of culture in terms of high and low. In lots of ways, uh, I'll come to that in later, that high culture has kind of disappeared in a way that used to exist. Um, but insofar as it doesn't exist anymore, it's now, it's now reserved for the elite, as it was before the period of popular modernism. 
Um, and then you've got a, then you've got a popular culture which has been emptied out of, of, of the traces of, of, of newness and of also of experimentalism. I mean, I guess partly what I'm, partly, partly what I'm talking about, referring to popular modernism, is then um, a relationship between uh, an articulation between the so-called high and the popular. Um, and I guess why art schools were significant uh, in the British context, were, were, that's where sociologically that interaction could happen. Because at that time, um, art schools were where you know, working class youth would go uh, you know, to have access to resources of high culture. But uh, I guess what was also significant about that moment was that then these, these uh, members of the working class who had access to, to art schools didn't simply reproduce the already existing forms in the already existing arenas. Instead, they, they used the knowledge and resources which they'd acquired as a result of uh, you know, being in, the, in those spaces to produce new kinds of culture and produce new kinds of cultural spaces. And you know, that, that, I think that's why British music, why it was able to spread so much uh, and propagate around the world was because of this production of a new kind of a new kind of space um, a new kind of weight for popular culture and um, I mean, uh, partly what I'm, I'm saying then is the uh, part of what, what was important about that period was the openness of what could be popular um, I think when things started to degenerate in this debate uh, was when and there was um, well, I mean, let's, let's say the, uh, we started off with um, elitism, which would maintain that anything popular was rubbish. You know, um, I guess the Adorno's, Adorno, Adorno's work on popular music, let's say, would be an example of that. Although I think Adorno is more sophisticated than he's often given credit for. But nevertheless, you know, Adorno's idea that, you know, there is the determinate qualities of the popular, let's say. You know, the pop in Adorno's formulation, there's the popular and there's the serious. That's interesting, because the, that's a kind of jump of taxonomy, you could say. The popular is not necessarily opposed to the serious, actually. But in Adorno, Adorno's construction, that's how it was. I think, uh, what, 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 when I'm talking about popular modernism, then, I'm saying that that's a challenge to that idea. Is that the, the, the serious could also be the popular. And that was, that was, that was of course, significant about that that moment, which I think is now a past moment, actually. But perhaps then we could um, turn to, this is typical of my talks, where um, <laughs> I said I would start with two quotes, I haven't even got to the second quote. <laughs> the, uh, the, the second quote is from Frederick Jameson, um, uh, about modernism itself. I mean, so, uh, what drives modernism to innovate um, Jameson writes in a singular modernity it's not some vision of the future or the new but the deep conviction that certain forms and expressions and procedures and techniques can no longer be used are worn out or stigmatised by their associations with a past that has become conventional or kitsch let's read that again so what drives modernism to innovate is not some vision of the future or the new but the deep conviction that certain, mode, uh, certain forms and expressions, procedures and techniques can no longer be used are worn out or stigmatised by their associations with the past that has become conventional or kitsch. And uh, uh, my simple claim is that practically everything today is kitsch in, in Jameson's sense, in the sense that Jameson's referring to here. Uh, what, what I mean by that is uh, that exactly that it is... Uh, it's rare to, it's back to this thing I said at the start, it's rare to encounter something that uh, does not feel already familiar now. And this is, I guess, one of the paradoxes, uh, paradoxes that I want to point to, um, to, do with, to, to do with modernity or post-modernity. Um, it's worthwhile just pausing on Jameson a moment, and I, th I think, um, and just to talk a little bit about why I think his work is so significant. So Jameson uh, you know, is perhaps best known still for his theory, theorization of postmodernism. Um, 
And I, I guess a lot of my work is, uh, I see as a continuation of certain aspects of Jameson's work. Um, Jameson famously claims that postmodernism is the cultural logic of late capitalism. Okay, so what in simple terms did he mean by postmodernism? And why does this matter now? Well, I think Jameson's work, if you go back to his work of the 80s, you know, it's practically 30 years ago, uh, it's, uh, it's extraordinarily prophetic, I think, of many tendencies, which even in his own time, you could say was somewhat, still somewhat marginal, uh, but are now dominant to the point there's almost nothing else but that. And, you know, for Jameson, what, what defines the, the postmodern fundamentally, or one of its fundamental defining uh, characteristics, uh, is the, uh, uh, the, exactly the sense of collapsed time. Um, and an anachronism, we could say. Um, perhaps I could best get to this by way of an example. An example I uh, give is uh, Jameson's discussion of um, now a forgotten film, the largely forgotten film called Body Heat, which I think came out in about 1984. This was a film that starred um, uh, William Hurt and Kathleen Turner, then, you know, fairly big name, well known, uh, big name um, Hollywood stars. What's significant about this film for Jameson is the uh, disjunction between the alleged set, uh, setting of the, the temporal setting of the film, I was set in the then present day in 1984, the, the disjunction between that and the form of the film, what it feels like to watch it as well. Um, what it, the form of the film is uh, entirely derived from the film noir of the 1930s, um, according to uh, according to Jameson. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, if you look at um, Body Heat, it feels like that. It feels like you're watching a film from the 30s, and yet, uh, if you look at the branded goods, the technology, uh, it's clearly set in what was then a present day. Uh, this, for me, this anachronistic temporality of a film like Body Heat is now the dominant temporality of practically everything. Uh, practically everything is like that. We, and particularly if we turn to music culture, um, music culture almost, I would say, almost, almost is too soft. All, all music of the 21st century could have happened in the 20th. Uh, the only difference uh, is the references. So, you know, you, you, could talk, you, know, you might have someone talking about t their Twitter feed in the, in the content. You might have something that dates it uh, in the content, but not in the form. The form is familiar. The form is super familiar. We will, we've, 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 we've heard it all be formed. Um, and that's what I meant by kitsch, the sense, you know, the sense of the kitsch is something that is not of, not of the current moment. But uh, you know, I, I think the problem is then that nothing feels as if it's of the current moment. And uh, that there is a, a failure, not only of the future, you could say, but of the capacity to muster the present in country. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Um, uh, and actually, they would largely be. I think the, the, probably the key exceptions to my claims would be television, American television, actually. Um, that you know, series like The Wire or, or Breaking Bad actually seem to be a new kind of form that's specific to the twenty-first century. And also, I mean, something like The Wire, I think, is significant because of its capacity to actually articulate something about the present. I think these are these are exceptions. Um, but, you know, it's a significant exception. Uh, to, a gen to a more general condition of kitsch. Um, you know, even high culture, so-called high culture is now kitsch. It's not, it, it persists, as like I say, um, you know, there are, there, there is an ex there's experimental culture, but it's experimental TMs, I put it. It's experimental, not in the sense that it's trying out things that haven't been heard, but in the sense there are a series of fairly well-defined well generic traits traits or characteristics of the experimental. You know, if you go to an experimental music festival, you won't hear anything new, you'll just hear things that are officially experimental, as you could say now. There's, there's, there, isn't, uh, there isn't much that you would hear there that you couldn't, like I said, you couldn't have heard in the 20th, 20th century. Um, so, I mean, so this is Jameson's claim. Jameson's claim about postmodernism then is 
the, the tendency towards pastiche, the inability to innovate new forms, and also then, but also more significantly perhaps, is the erasure, the erasure of historicity as such, you could say. By which I mean the erasure of a sense of the, you know, what I was referring to earlier, a sense of the marking of, uh, of cultures being marked by time and marking time. A sense of cultural objects, artifacts, uh, networks belonging to a particular moment, articulating that moment, expressing that moment, and then being made obsolete via a new, new, uh, a new present and a new representation of that present in, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in culture. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're, those examples apart that I re mentioned uh, just now, we're really missing uh, this capacity to articulate the present. In lots of ways, then, that means we don't really have a present anymore. Um, that's because, you know, our experience, what is it to experience now in the 21st century? It is to experience a culture that is endlessly recycled, you could say. Um, that uh, is, 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 would already have been familiar to people in the 20th century. Was disappeared then as a sense of future shock, you could say. Um, we can easily imagine, we can easily sort of prove this by thought experiment. If, if we imagine, you know, just sticking on the music example now, if we imagine any kind of music being been back 20 years, 20 years to 1994, imagine someone in 1994 listening to it. You know, you've, you've taken this music back in time to them and saying, listen to this. What are they, how are they going to respond to that? They're going to go, my fucking God, I can't believe this. The future sounds so different to today. They're not going to say that. They're going to say instead, my fucking God, is it really the things sound so much so similar in 20 years' time to how they do now? So you have to think about the difficulty. The, the, this, I think, my strong thesis can be uh, demonstrated by this, this example. And what I mean by the flattening of, the flattening of time. If you think about the difference between 1974 and 1994, all of the different styles of music that had that had uh, been born and died in that period, um, then think about 1994 to 2014, uh, or think of even go from seven, from 1954 to 1974, from Elvis Presley to Donna Summer. You know, uh, that's massive, massive, and a whole world, whole sonic world had been born and died in that period. Many of them, uh, and the same in the next period. But in, the, in the 20 years following, not so much. And still, our sense of the futuristic in music uh, will, will 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 still be what was either produced by Kraftwerk in the 70s. This still sounds. This still counts as futuristic, but it's futuristic in the same way that you could say that the Gothic font is Gothic. It doesn't mean it. It doesn't relate to an actual future that's going to be different from today, it's just an already existing style, you know, and uh, all, 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 all that sense of the futuristic would be 90s dance music, you know, but essentially 90s dance music has not been superseded by 21st century dance music, it still sounds like it belongs to the same palette, of course there's not, of course there are things which are really slightly different, but only slightly, and at the level of kind of brute sensorial sensation, you know, what it, what it feels like to hear this stuff, it doesn't feel that different at all. Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, how, so I guess that's what I mean by the cancellation of the future. The future is now cancelled, but it's also been erased that we don't really, it's not also, the, the key thing of, of Jameson to, to bear in mind is that Jameson says, what, what also gets lost is this sense of a narrative of time anyway. The sense of things, um, uh, you know, the sense of historicity meaning the sense of specific historical contingency or specific historical location of, of culture. This gets lost. And I think, you know, that what, as I said, when he, was, when he was talking about in the 80s, it was a phenomenon, uh, but there's, there's still something to oppose it to. Now in the 21st century, this is the dominant mode and the dominant form of cultural time. Um, in other ways, in 2012, 2014, the 60s feel much closer than they did in 1980. Um, well, let's be clear about this though, I'm not suggesting that there's a sense of this pro cultural progress. And uh, uh, I think progress is a political narrative, uh, not, not an aesthetic narrative. 
and I mean, I think as, to go back to Bifo's uh, quote from there, both senses have gone. The sense of political progress has disappeared, uh, but the sense of an aesthetic modernism has disappeared. Modernism, modernism to me then is, 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 is exactly the same that Jameson says about a certain relationship to the present. And that's what validates, validates culture from the modernist perspective is a relationship to the current moment. It's that that's gone. So you wouldn't, one wouldn't want to say that, um, you, um, you know, 90s electronic music was better than Miles Davis. That's preposterous. What one would say is, is but that, you know, that you couldn't be, you couldn't produce Miles Davis' cool jazz in the 90s and think that that was adequate to the present moment. You, you know, I guess one of the key, th Miles Davis, I think, as a key figure of popular modernism, is exactly somebody who refused to uh, stop reinventing himself. You know, who, who's very, very conscious of what Jameson's talking about. That it's not, it's not, it's not adequate to keep replacing, to keep replaying your, 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 your hits from years ago. What was once modern quickly becomes obsolete. The whole of Miles Davis' career and his, um, you know, uh, numerous reinventions of himself and his sound uh, bear witness to this, this, this being a guiding principle in, in, in his work, really. Um, so it's not progress, it, it, but it is about a sense of, uh, you know, fitness to the current moment. And this is fitness in the sense of adequacy, but also, you know, a, a relationship. And, um, and this, this is what it, this was largely, what I'm saying is largely lacking at the moment. <coughs> um, so I guess the question is then, why? Why has this happened? What, what is it that led to this s slow cancellation of the future? And part of the reason I found this phrase from Bifo so suggestive is this notion of the slowness of it. It's both the, um, the, 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 the terminal quality of it, that the future has been cancelled, but also that it's not cancelled in one go. We don't experience the future as an event that suddenly just disappears. Uh, it's not, there's not, not, it's not one moment we have the future, the next moment we have, the next moment it's gone. It's that the conditions for, um, the conditions for uh, a relationship to the future are gradually but systematically determined in this period. And um, using the, the British example again, then, I mean, it's pretty clear that what, what was at stake there was the the installation of neoliberalism, um, and I think uh, this is one of the things that I guess I've become, as I've got older, I've become more aware of, uh, is the political, institutional, economic and social preconditions for cultural production. It's, as I said, if since I was born into this moment, uh, the moment that they included popular modernism as a key element, I took for granted those conditions. One can't take them for granted anymore because they don't exist. And certainly one becomes aware of, the much more aware of how those conditions allowed that culture to exist in the first place. Um, okay, so what do I mean by this? And uh, uh, Essentially then, this, uh, this installation of neoliberalism to the point of total naturalization that's what I mean by capitalist realism. Um, and capitalist realism can be summarized by the, f you know, another phrase from Jameson, uh, the idea that uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Something that's become increasingly true. We can, we can all entertain all manner of uh, uh, catastrophic scenarios about the end of the world now. We're out and, uh, invited to do so by the apocalyptic nature of the news a lot of the time particularly in relation to climate. Um, you know, the idea that the world can end, that's uh, always in our minds. The idea that there was an alternative to capitalism, that has disappeared in large measure. Even, mm. uh, perhaps especially amongst anti-capitalists. And I, I, I actually think that the formation of anti-capitalism is a symptom of what I'm describing. Um, that uh, the retreat from uh, the positive project of communism to the negative project of anti-capitalism. Not that I'm saying necessarily that communism was the right positive project, but nevertheless it was a positive project. Um, and I think part of the significance of uh, 
you know, the, the operaist thinkers like uh, Mario Tronti, etc., was to a positive first, um, first the movement towards communism, and first, you know, the uh, the uh, uh, agency of workers, and second, capitalism as a response to as, as response to the insurgency and agency of workers. Um, and, but I think that that's historical. That's an historical model. Um, actually, as a parenthesis, I think part of the problem with um, the work of Negri and Hart is that they they still assume this model. Uh, they, that they stop talking about workers. They talk about the multitude instead. Uh, however, I, I don't I don't think there is a multitude. There is no multitude. If there were a multitude, we wouldn't be in the problems that we've got now. The very fact. The very point is the very. Uh, the very issue is the impossibility of a multitude in current conditions, I would argue. That's kind of a, a side, side issue. But, I mean, the, the, the key point being then um, uh, the, the, this, which, this sense of retreat, um, you know, which again went in stages. You know, I think there was, uh, and it's not only about the formal uh, organised left, you could say. It was also about the counterculture that emerged out of the 60s. Counterculture that emerged out of the 60s then had a, had, you know, and, and this is partly why this music, the, the music continues to resonate. The music of the 60s continues to resonate. Why not just because of its qualities, it, the, the eternal qualities of creativity? There are no eternal qualities of creativity. It, it's because, because there is this residue, this existential residue of a, a, a Promethean ambition to radically transform society out of all recognition. This is what the 60s was about. You know, people really thought that, you know, that, that everything could be changed. Everything, uh, inclu you know, including key institutions like the family, which have been, and I think, the, um, the renaturalization, the renormalization of the family is a very key part of the establishment of capitalist realism, actually. It's no accident that um, actually existing neoliberalism, in, particularly in the 80s, with its key figures, um, Actually, the, probably the first key figure of neoliberalism is, is, um, uh, is um, from the 70s. I mean, the key, the key moment uh, of, the, of the, uh, the traumatic kind of turning of history towards neoliberalism is Chile in 1973, the defeat of the Andy, the Andy government and the imposition by uh, you know, US back coup of um, um, the, the, the Pinochet administration. This, this is a kind of um, dry run for everything that will happen in the 80s in lots of ways, in, uh, in, in softer forms in the, in the US and um, uh, in, in the US and uh, in, in, in the UK and here. Um, I mean, what I was going to say is, I think if you look at Reagan or Thatcher, uh, we can see that the, the way in which actually existing neoliberalism always also depends on neoconservatism as well. Even though there's no... Um, the level of entailment, philosophical argument or position, neoliberalism and neoconservatism are n not only incompatible but actually opposed to one another in lots of respects. Neoliberalism is a kind of amoral, uh, amoral market logic. Neoconservatism is a moral position. You know, and essentially, neoconservatism is an uh, is orientated against the counterculture of the 60s. We have to remember that Reagan, someone like Reagan, you know, R Reagan came to uh, early prominence as a, a reactionary figure at the time of the, the student protest in the 60s in California. That's how, you know, uh, well, that's how he emerged as a political figure after his career was a shit act. Well, you know, many argued that that career was a shit act and never, never ended. And just continued, of course. Um, but the, um, so, I mean, I think that, um, what, you know, actually existing neoliberalism always had this, Neoconservative side. A neoconservative side was a way of um, neutralizing the damaging aspects of the 60s counterculture. This vision of total psychic, tra psychic and social transformation and rejection of all existing institutions. Um, there was a way of uh, neutralizing that. But I mean, the other side of neoliberalism was a way of capturing certain energies from the 60s, you could say. Uh, the, 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 you know, this is the famous, you know, there's a famous, lots of famous stuff now in the 60s led to neoliberalism. 
I think it's much more complicated than that. You know, like the Boltanski and Giappato thesis of uh, you know, uh, new capitalism, etc., to some extent part of this. Um, I think it's more complicated than that, as I say. I think it, 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 the neoliberalism could take on certain aspects of the 60s counterculture and um, you know, set it back as this new form of, um, set it back as a liberation. And, and, but partly what's significant about that was the way in which neoliberalism was able to figure the left as belonging to a kind of superseded historical moment. And so the uh, neoliberalism seized control of the nar narrative of history and said there's only one future now and it's a neoliberal future. Uh, the left is consigned to the past. The left belongs to the past. The left is bureaucratic, it's top down. The left tells you what you want to do, what, how to behave. Uh, we let you control your own lives. And this kind of rhetoric of uh, autonomy, you know, of um, uh, uh, autonomy, of um, self determination, was, was kind of crucial to the success of neoliberalism. Uh, but I mean, I think we, you know, it's important to bear in mind the, the false nature of those claims that, that neoliberalism has not enabled people to have more control over their lives, uh, except in very specific and local ways. I mean, I'd argue in lots of ways to control. It, 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 um, and, and of course, what was, you know, why, partly why that was, was that neoliberalism was, you know, was just technically accurately. You know, the term neoliberalism describes what it was. It was a neoliberalism that was based on individuals. Um, and so what disappeared was a concept of collective agency, of collective self-determination. Um, but without collective self-determination, I would argue, there is no individual self-determination. Right. So individual self-determination is, is usually an illusion uh, in conditions where there can be no collective self-determination. Because actually what happens is you know, when, you know, the, the, if we, one's talking about, if one wants to evoke again the concept of progress in politics, uh, I would say there is such a thing as progress. It's not guaranteed. Not as Hegelian Marxists of the old school used to believe that there was, history was going in a certain direction, it was guaranteed to go in that direction. No, there's a, it's a virtual trajectory which is obstructed and can, can entirely disappear at that point. But so far as there is a progress, it, it is a progress towards collective self-determination and away from tyranny, and tyranny and the control by uh, a small elite. And what we can see is, with you know, the rise of neoliberalism, uh, by practically any metric, has meant the the reassertion of control by elites over over, over society. And, and you know, partly how they reassert that control is by pretending that we've all got more control than we ever had. Than we ever previously had, um, and you know, I think this is just simply <coughs> false. You know, it's a, just a crude ideological falsehood, basically. You know, to, to distract us from this uh, this overall lack of control that we've got, and a sense of um, chaos, powerlessness, and depression, which which is actually the, the which are actually the overwhelming affects in the, in the 21st century. Uh, even choice itself. Uh, the key neoliberal concept, uh, you know, just feeds into the one of the, 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 the increasing choices that we that we have are largely uh, irrelevant. Uh, that that they amount to you know largely insignificant choices over kind of consumer preference uh, from an already existing menu of options. This is what it, you know when, when corporations ask you to interact with them. This is what they offer you. They offer you, they give you a menu of options and you choose one of them. And this, this is a model for the, the, the so-called increased kind of choice that we have. It's a choice in, you know, that, uh, increasingly within a field dominated by the, the corporate model. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think the key move for capitalist realism, or one of them was the appeal to, the ideological appeal to individuals, but the reality of, of corporate, you know, increasing corporate control over our sort of lives. Um, and um, I think that how this has um, the eighties was the key battleground. I think then when um, when this combination of neoliberalism and neoconservatism uh, won hegemony, 
you know, uh, one uh, kind of ideological, one, one of the struggle for what would count as dominant reality now. Um, and of course, by the end of the 80s, we've seen the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, it's no great loss in many ways. You know, few uh, in, the, in, the West, in the left were under any illusion about the Soviet Union by that point. However, what, what probably we didn't, uh, what we underestimated at the time, was the impact of one, what, what, you know, when, when the Soviet Union disappeared, that the, the impact that would have on um, just the capacity for social, imagin for social imagination, you could say, social dreaming, the sense of an outside. Uh, I mean, with the Soviet Union, Soviet bloc, that there was an alternative to capitalism, albeit a sullied, corrupted, you know, um, uh, alternative, an alternative that few could believe in anymore. But nevertheless, there was a space of the world, a significant space of the world, that was, you know, uh, that, that there was not capitalist. It might have been worse in lots of respects than capitalism, but it was still there. Um, and I guess the, the ascendance of China and of, of a neoliberalized China intensified the sense that even, you know, even, even countries now run by the Communist Party are capitalist. There is no alternative. Even the Chinese accept this now. This would be part of the story. Um, and I think uh, perhaps one of the key to, to sort of get a lot of this across uh, is if, if you go and look on uh, YouTube at the, uh, if you've seen this, you may have seen this already, is the, the Apple commercial from the Super Bowl in 1984. Uh, the Apple was made by Ridley Scott. You know, who had made two years before, and had made Blade Runner, and just before that had made Alien. Two of the really, I think, still last great science fiction films that were made. But then he made this commercial, a very short commercial for, for Apple, um, which kind of uh, condenses in a form of a capitalist dreaming, that's what advertising is, you know, uh, the, all of the narratives that I've just put forward in lots of ways. And, uh, of, 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 large elements of those narratives. Because in this commercial what we see is um, a world of kind of grey drones shuffling around, being um, uh, dictated to by a kind of large uh, 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 screen with the figure of a kind of a dictatorial big brother type, fig, uh, type individual in this um, dominating. Uh, then what we see is a young, a young woman run on. She, uh, unlike everything else in the scene, is in colour, the colours of Apple at the time. And she, she's wielding this hammer. She throws this hammer into the screen and shatters it. And um, the, 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 uh, the tagline says something like, you know, in, 19, in 1984 you will see why, you know, uh, 1984 won't, actually 1984 won't be like Orwell's 1984 effectively. Um, and you know, partly this was uh, interesting because it was a form of experimental advertising at the time, highly controversial. The nearly didn't get shown because uh, you know it doesn't feature Apple products in any way. It's this form of conceptual, affective advertising that we're now used to, where the product is is completely off screen and you're being sold the incidental you know, uh, affective uh, qualities of the product, not the commodity itself. Um, but it's also, you know, it's clearly a narrative about time and freedom, right, and, histori his and history. Because what is condensed in this figure of grey drones shuffling around, being commanded by a kind of spectacle, is both the idea of the Soviet Union as the outside to capitalism, and the idea of kind of mainframe, big computers, the old computer industry pre-California, you know, um, IBM, etc. You know, it's dream work and condensation that they, these two things are condensed together, that all belong to the past, the Californian ideology will come, and this is, this will, is what the future will be. And this is what happened. You know, if you want to look at um, a piece of 80s social prophecy, um, you know, that, then that is it. The, essentially, we, that does predict the world in which we now live, a world dominated by Apple. Um, but what is, it to, you know, what is it to live in that world? Um, is it a world where we really are more free than we ever were before, where we have more autonomy. No, it isn't that world at all. It's a world increase where we're more anxious than, than we ever were before, uh, in lots of ways. Um, and you know, I guess the, the big headline for what I'm, uh, the big headline uh, for my explanation of 
the decline of popular modernism, and therefore the slow cancellation of the future, would be the uh, installation of anxiety into all areas of social life, uh, and a certain, then a new experience of time. But it's, it's new. Uh, it's new at the phenomenological level, at the level of what it is to experience it, uh, but in a seeming paradox, uh, that very newness uh, is what also means we don't have any new culture on either side. The music critic Simon Reynolds puts it this way, that um, in the 21st century, everyday life is sped up, but culture is slowed down, you could say. The, uh, Another way of looking at this is um, that boredom has disappeared. Uh, but that means no one is bored, but everything is boring. You could say that would be the slogan. No one is bored, we, we don't, uh, boredom is a kind of luxury now. Uh, or or you, you practically, you have to be a kind of, uh, you have to be super disciplined in order to experience boredom. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to, with, you have to withdraw yourself from your, from the smart, from your smartphone. Uh, in order to be bored. I mean, the, the smartphone, part of the significance of the smartphone is it, it constantly, um, is this constant feed of low level stimulation which prevents boredom, prevents you encountering boredom. So at the, the very points, at the very points when we used to be bored, you know, if you're waiting in a queue, you're, wait, you're, waiting, for a, you're waiting for a bus, you're waiting for a, that's when, uh, or, you know, the very moment when someone just says, oh, I've got to go to the, to the, to the toilet or something like that, the very moment someone does that, what do we do immediately? We immediately reach for our smartphones. So any vacant or empty time is immediately filled in by, by the smartphone. Um, and I think this then links to one of, um, you know, uh, Bifo's key ideas, really, which is the inundation of the nervous system as a result of what I would call capitalist cyberspace. And I want to use that term deliberately because I want to distinguish uh, capitalist cyberspace from um, cyberspace as such. We don't know what we don't know what cyberspace will be like if it was in a, in, in a world not dominated by corporations. So let's leave that aside. Actually, let's talk about actually existing cyberspace, which is a space dominated by corporations. Um, and and uh, we have to. Uh, also bear in mind then, I think, the way in which the experience of modernity, you could say, has been taken over almost entirely via communicative capitalism, to use Jody Dean's phrase. Um, okay, what do I mean by that? Well, Marshall Berman in his book, All That Solid Melts Into Air, this gives a kind of account of classic modernity. You know, the phrase from Marx, All That Solid Melts Into Air, mean that uh, the experience of modernity then is always this kind of on the edge of this existential abyss. Because we, the modern doesn't, the experience of modernity is not an experience of a fully constituted totality, which is the modern. The experience of modernity is of constant obsolescence. That, you know, what it is is to feel that anything that you're now we now have will be made obsolete by future developments. Um, that, that does persist, but it only persists in a in limited way now. Not in, we don't feel that in relation to culture. On the contrary, we feel that any culture from any, aspect, any element of the 20th century can come back and be presented to us as contemporary now. But we do feel it in terms of technology. We do feel that, um, you know, that the, the, in other words, the, te the, technical, the technological upgrade and the sense of inbuilt obsolescence, um, this, this is the Apple model, this is the Apple business model. You know, the Apple business model is based on the idea that you won't have one iPod, you'll have many iPods. And of course that's not because they make it. So they, One, there's two things, isn't it? One, they build them so they'll collapse after a certain amount of time. Two, um, the nature of constantly updating technology means they don't want to function anymore. Um, all, you know, always being able to upgrade or update uh, our formats. And uh, as we know, upgrading seldom means improvement. But um, you know, upgrading is crucial to this, um, to this sense of panicked Commodity time, you could say. That uh, we, you know, we're, we're always slight, even if the commodity is free in a certain way, like iTunes. Uh, then, you know, the, the sense of that, uh, you know, things are always about to be upgraded. That any particular form that we've got will be made obsolete. But it's banal. It's now banal. This isn't a banal. It's not, it, and it lacks the aesthetic dimension 
that, that was previously there with modernity or modernism. You could say modernity is this experience of, of obsolescence. Modernism was a relationship to that, an aesthetic relationship to that. We don't have that aesthetic relationship anymore. Uh, we're just subordinated to it. Uh, and this means that, that what, what characterizes that then is this combination of um, anxiety and boredom. Or, or uh, not boredom, anxiety and the boring. Um, we, in lots of ways, the 21st century is a banal dystopia, you could say. Uh, even 20 years ago, if we'd have shown pictures of the future to people of, you know, London, I think, worse than anywhere else in Europe, uh, uh, or certainly at, at a more advanced stage of uh, psychopathology, is, um, you know, if you look at whole carriages of people in London, uh, you know, it's completely enthralled by tiny screens. Um, this uh, banal mutation that has happened, the production of the boring cyborg, well, we've all become boring cyborgs now. We're all cyborgs, we're all attached to our mobile phones, but it's boring. You know, it's not, it's not, the, it's not the cyborg as a figure of alterity, as it was imagined by people, you know, people like Donna Haraway in the 80s, or in science fiction or whatever, or in Blade Runner, as I mentioned earlier. The, you know, the cyborg has become normal and has become utterly boring. And this, this form of technology then, this, this dominant form of techno technological regime, I should say, rather than technology itself, uh, it has involved this uh, refashionalization, which is partly a reference to um, Deleuze and Guattari in the notion of uh, the, you know, the face that captures them. That, you know, it's no accident that, that uh, Facebook, as the name for the, one of the dominant uh, aspects of this regime of subject subjectivity, but it's not only that, it's also reality TV, etc. This um, reduction of culture back into a kind of series of mirrors which reflect kind of radically individualized um, people competing with one another. This is the dominant, you know, the dumb. If there was a 20th century form, it is reality TV and it's that. And reality TV then it is a, it's capitalist social relations as a form of entertainment. You're all on your own. You may form temporary alliances with others, uh, but essentially you're competing. You're competing against other people, and there's only one winner. And that's what the Hunger Games is good. I think. That's what the Hunger Games is very important as a series of films because it actually captures more than anything else what you know the, the, what it is to live in the 21st century in lots of ways. Um, but I mean, it's just it's just to sort of start bringing it to an end. Okay, yeah, I'll just bring it towards the end. I mean, so I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is then, I just want to focus in on, 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 the, on this question of time, politics of time as being crucial to, to, to all of uh, everything I've said so far. Um, with then, what is it, you know, the, the, what, is it, what does this mean? It means it's a kind of jamming of the social brain, you could say. Um, the, the key ideas of neoliberalism is the idea that creativity is equally distributed amongst if we distribute in time and amongst individuals, really, that uh, everyone has this capacity to be creative, and what blocks it is uh, state regulation, uh, socialists, bureaucrats, <coughs> all, um, all of this kind of thing. And so, if we remove those things, if we remove bureaucracy, if we remove kind of uh, uh, meddling social democrats, you know, with their social housing policies and all of that, if you remove that, we just left, leave people to themselves, then their natural creativity will flow out. Uh, act will flow out. That's just, that's simply you know, this ideological smokescreen, I'm saying, that um, conceals the fact that actual creativity needs preconditions. And one of the things it simply needs is time. And uh, what, we, what we most don't have now is time. And, and you know, if you think about actual creativity when it occurs, it often occurs when the, the brain is idling, which isn't the same as the brain being idle in um, not doing anything, but it's where it's not already occupied. Um, and often, you know, to go back to those examples I gave earlier, often people get their ideas while waiting for a bus, or while lying in the bath, or whatever. Because uh, their, brain, their brain was somewhat liberated from um, urgencies, and this is the, perhaps the key term we introduced, urgencies. Uh, now, there's barely a moment in our lives where we're not a 
assailed by urgencies. I mean, what is a, what is a smartphone if not an urgency field? You know, that when, when we pick up, a, we have to bear in mind with the social, social media is it's basically a whole series of commands. Um, you can ignore those commands if you want, but your nervous system still has to feel them at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an unconscious level, if not a conscious level. I mean, uh, you know, like the, the, uh, we used to get commands all the time, but they, they, they were somewhat um, discreet. Uh, I mean, discreet in the sense of uh, spaced out. That, uh, you know, that they were on advertising billboards, they were on the television, you know, you could turn the television off, you know, um, etc. Uh, you didn't carry these urgencies around with you. I, mean, I think it's, we need to do a, a kind of reversal of understanding what a smartphone is. We don't have a smartphone. That's, a smartphone is our means of interface with capitalist cyberspace. So when you, carry, when you have a smartphone, you carry capitalist cyberspace around with you at all times. And that's unprecedented. You know, all of this uh, ostensibly bleak stuff, Guy Debord, Society of the Spectacle, that's, that's like Jane Austen. You know, it's like a genteel. You might as well be talking about the 18th centuries. But when, with, with a smartphone, what you're talking about is a... Um, uh, it's, it's, it's better, it's more seen like the, the face sucker from Alien. That it's basically is an attention, uh, attention sucker and drainer, uh, which is very, you know, which... which uh, whose capacity to uh, drain our resources, uh, our attentional and energetic resources, uh, is massively reinforced by enormous propaganda <coughs> coming from uh, capitalist corporations, telling us it's great to have one. And also reinforced by work, conditions of work. Um, one of the things I haven't mentioned is, uh, you know, is post-fallism. Uh, so, I mean, of course, capitalist realism, I think you know, another way of looking at it is Simply a combination of neoliberal ideology with post fordism you could say. And post fordism their meaning on a simple level, the experience of uh, precarity, uh, of, uh, of radical precariousness. Um, but I think this extends beyond merely being about casual work. Of course, the casual, the, the casual and temporary work has increased enormously in the period that I'm talking about. It's more that even those people in um, supposedly secure employment also feel much more precarious than they used to. It's partly, partly because we, we all have to sort of, uh, comp you know, if you're an academic, you have to compete for students now. The effect of marketization, so called pseudo marketization, is one in which the, 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 you know, d deprives, let's say, lecturers of confidence uh, because you, they feel that situations are precarious, that you, you, we have to constantly be marketing ourselves and market our programs in order to get to compete for these students, etc., etc. Which if we don't get them, we'll be removed. So, you know, th th that's just one example, there are many, but just of this, the way in which the sense of precariousness is now dominant, you could say. Um, and part of what I'm arguing then is <coughs> that another aspect of, uh, is against another aspect of neoliberal mythology, which is that related to that, that, that thing I just said about creativity just emerges if we allow it to, is the idea that um, security breeds indolence, you could say. That it's only if you remove security from people uh, that they'll be creative. This is, this is, a, this is a total myth. Um, and I guess that this is the power of the British example for me, you know, that the British music culture example, is that uh, it's quite clear that, that that music culture happened because people had time to do it. At, at, you know, that when they were at school, instead of doing their courses, or alongside doing their courses, they would also form groups. Um, why could they do that? Because they didn't have four other jobs, like, the, like students are required to now, in order to fund their education. How did, why is that the case? Because they had, um, they, they had student grants to live on, they had no fees to pay, they could claim unemployment benefit in the, in the holidays, they could... Um, they had social housing to live in. They had, um, they had, if they didn't have social housing, they could squat in London, and you know any number of these things, which were the uh, actual preconditions for creativity in that period. Which neoliberalism is a project to have removed those. And um, so this, this, if we think about now, contrast that, contrast the the, the acres of time which those, uh, those those kind of art students of the 60s in Britain had with any of us now. 
you know that, and that, that, that that's the significance of the smartphone thing. Is uh, you know is that we're constantly in this in, in this urgency field now, and where things flip as well. Where the I mean, part of that is the particular characteristic of post-Fordism is the experience of uh, the continuity between work and enjoyment. Okay, why do we have smartphones? Uh, part of the reason we we'll say we say to ourselves, well, because they're leisure objects, we're told they're, you know, they're, they're enjoyable. But also, like, uh, you know, if we're with our partners or whatever, and, they, and we're checking our messages, you know, what, what's our excuse for doing it? Well, I have to check it for work, you know. I have to check it for work, or maybe work is trying to contact me. And it's not that you were just making that up, it's not a lie, it's also true. But it's also false, because we, it's a compulsion. It's a libidinal compulsion, we have to check the phone. And that's what I mean about banal mutation. Boring. We're mutated. Our nervous systems are rhythms of time. Um, our micro behaviors in terms of uh, a whole new kind of interface, a whole new way of cutting up the human nervous system has occurred via smartphones in the last few years. The last only five years, let's say, where you know, this relationship between our fingers and our eyes and the screens determines uh, a lot of our subjectivity. Um, you know, but that's boring. It's actually it's, 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 it's radical in the sense that it's whole swathe of the population have been changed for this form of behaviour, but it's also boring. You know, it doesn't, it, it, it means that people are much more constrained in a um, series of, uh, in a culture which is increasingly kind of repetitive, homogenous, etc. So, you know, that, that will be, that is the link then between what I was saying at the start then, the big claims about the end of the future and also the end of the present and the, the, the kind of onset of naturalisation of capitalist realism, uh, that we, we are inside this urgency field. And what does that mean? It means that effectively we're, it, 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 this is a relationship to dreaming. This is where I sort of want to end up really. Part of how you can see this succession of what I talked about, you could say there was, in the 20th century, first of all, there was the discovery of the unconscious, you could say. Discovery of the unconscious. And conscious has always been a motor for, for, for so-called creativity and a resource, obviously. But there was a kind of reflexive acknowledgement of that in the early 20th century by the influence of Freud and of the Surrealists, who explicitly talked about the unconscious as a resource. Then, you know, capitalism moves in quickly, onto, moves into this kind of dreaming. It then um, metabolizes this dreaming in the form of advertising, in the form of Hollywood, etc., etc. It's the second phase. The third phase is the elimination of dreaming as such, you could say. It's like a form of... Um, it's a cultural equivalent of the kind of uh, ecological crisis. That the dreaming resources of, the, this is partly what I'm saying, the dreaming resources that were built up uh, in the 20th century have now been used up. We don't have them anymore. And this is why Inception is the, one of the, is the great symptomatic film of the 21st century, really. Uh, Inception kind of sums up everything I've said, really, in, in lots of ways. I guess it's inter one of the things, interesting things about Inception is the lack of technology in it, right? They don't really. The technology that you. When is it set? Is it in the future or some alternative present to now? Um, you can't really tell. But I think it's really essentially about the phenomenology of, of, of communicative capitalism in lots of ways and what it's like to be on that. It's not really about dreaming at all, but the impossibility of dreaming, you could say. And it's certainly about the, the lost unconscious. Um, it's really one of the bleakest, like just uh, phenomenologically or formally, it's one of the bleakest, a highly bleak film, I think, in terms of. It's almost the inversion of Hitchcock, you could say. With Hitchcock, you had a films which were ostensibly naturalistic, but which drew upon the kind of landscapes from surrealism, De Carico, etc. That uh, with, with Inception, you have a film which is ostensibly about dreaming, which it looks like uh, it, it takes place in boring hotels. The whole of the film practically takes place in boring hotels. It, it's astonishing that, you know, the, the, what, what this is an image of the total depletion of the unconscious, you could say. There is no unconscious left anymore. And some of the most depressing scenes in the film, if you've, you know, I can imagine most of you have seen, some of the most depressing films when we see this unformatted unconscious and it looks like poor, what it is, boring CGI. You know, and there's no alterity to it, no strangeness about this space anymore. It's just a kind of a waiting, a waiting kind of more, de more development, a more, a waiting the building of a, yet another kind of uh, non-place, yet another kind of uh, uh, corporate space which could be anywhere in the world kind of thing. Um, and also I think what's significant about 
inception then is this notion, is this sense of urgency, constant urgency. That, uh, that there's about five boring dreams to, to, to choose from, all of them generically familiar, kind of Hollywood tropes. Each of the, all of the all of the levels in inception are completely stereotypical. Uh, but you can't even settle into any of those because they're interrupted by another one. And this is what our experience of everyday life is like now. Um, our capacity for projectile time to be absorbed in something um, is always deferred and, uh, and meet and with, is taken over by these urgencies, which um, assume you know, total control of our consciousness until not, and then we get another embedded urgency on top of that. Just to, uh, I think we all know this, but just to, just to get this concrete, you know, more we, 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 start off doing, we start off doing some task and we get an email, we deflect it onto doing that task. But we probably can't finish that because we might get some simultaneous message coming in off another screen or, on, or on, off, um, off, uh, off the same email, which supersedes that previous one. It's also something we don't really want to do, but that be, then becomes the next urgency. So we get lost in this embedded field of urgencies, one after the other. Um, and th this capacity for a, a time where we, we can be absorbed, where, the, where the, the, we're engaged in this open-ended experience of time, an experimental experience of time, we don't know where it's leading us, this is always deferred behind these immediate kind of urgencies. And this, uh, this then is, 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 just to conclude then, is then a certain experience of kind of collective dream time, you can say. That, you know, what was available previously was collective, of collective dream space, um, which was much more, which was much more open, lucid, um, where experience of time was kind of thick and absorptive. The the you know the, the inception model of of, uh, of dream time is a time based on anxiety dreams, you could say, and the whole of the social field increasingly resembles an anxiety dream, in which we are corralled by this set of urgencies without end. And you know, I think that this is in, in those conditions when um, when we're, we're constantly assailed by these uh, chains of urgencies. It's no wonder that we uh, we don't have the capacity to uh, absorb ourselves either in the production of the new or in the absorption of the new either. Uh, and that's where I'd like to sort of end it. Somewhat. Ordinary.